Well, hello, Trudy. Hi, Susan. Really, really a pleasure to see you again. I oh know. My gosh. Uh, <laughs> so I'm so happy that we get to talk. Let me just give people a little bit of an intro into who you are, because, you know, some people <laughs> might not know what we're going to, you know, what the focus is going to be. And I think your bio will inform that instantly. Trudy Goodman, PhD, is the founding teacher of Insight LA and co-founder of the Institute for Meditation and Psychotherapy. Trudy has trained in mindfulness and Zen since 1973, holds a graduate degree in developmental psychology from Harvard, and is one of the senior Buddhist teachers in the United States. She's taught at universities and retreat centers worldwide for over 40 years, was the fourth ever teacher of mindfulness-based stress reduction with Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, one of my favorite people in all the world, at the University of Massachusetts. And for 25 years, Trudy practiced mindfulness-based psychotherapy with children, teenagers, couples, and individuals. Your website, I know, is trudygoodman.com and insightla.com. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we've been trying to do this for such a long time and thrilled that we get to talk for a little bit. You've trained in both meditation and psychology and psychotherapy. I understand you even had training with um, Piaget, which is, you know, for a, a big, uh, those of us in the field of developmental psychology is like, wow, that's super yeah. amazing. Can you talk a little bit about the inter, interweaving of mindfulness-based practices and psychotherapy, especially as it relates to children and families? Yeah, I mean, you know, at the beginning, when I began my practice, I was a single mom. And so I would just catch teachings or retreats or whatever I could do it would depend on when I had childcare, when I had time off work. It was all very homemade and from scratch and invented that way. And so I was in the throes of parenting while I was learning about mindfulness. We didn't call it, there wasn't mindfulness right. then. There were the Buddhist retreats. And so, you know, I was learning Buddhist psychology essentially through meditation practices primarily, where it's first person introspection learning, you know, whereas most of our academic learning is third person, um, it really learning how to be aware of and learn from your inner experience of life. And that was very radical at that time. And then um, it was really, mindfulness was one, I would call it the keystone in this sort of brilliant, arch of Buddhist teachings. Um, and it was John, of course, Kabat-Zinn, who, who really saw that he could take, that within mindfulness, there was so much contained of the rest of the teaching that he could take that and present it in a way that would appeal to everybody who didn't have any idea of wanting to be a Buddhist. I mean, I didn't want to be a Buddhist. I just needed these teachings. And I had had some very powerful experiences in the course of becoming a mother that I didn't know how to understand. They wow. were spiritual openings that came to me completely unbidden. I was not a meditator. I had never taken any interest in anything like Buddhism. Um, and so I was searching for some way to understand the things that I had glimpsed. And, and I found what I was looking for in the context of the Buddhist meditation and learning those practices um, and then working with John right at the beginning of his establishing his program at the medical school in UMass in Worcester. Um, I, I'm, I was very lucky because I wanted always to be able to share what I was learning with, you know, my colleagues in, in, in psychotherapy and the schools where I worked. And, but, you know, there was, there was nothing in those days. Meditation was considered a fruitcake activity, basically. <laughs> um, you know, and you, it was not something that you would advertise in your professional life at all. Now it's become a credential, but... It was not, it was the opposite then. And, and so I feel like all of the learning that I did was sort of on the job, so to speak. I wish for my daughter's sake that I had had this learning before she was born 
and that I had didn't, you know, and I think many parents would say the same thing, like, oh my gosh, you know, parenting by definition, you learn on the job. And that means you make all the mistakes that learners make. Um, and that's why they invented grandparents. You know? <laughs> so that there's somebody, you know, hopefully, I mean, I only had one and didn't see her very often, but hopefully, you know, there's a grandparent in your child's life yeah. that um, can provide the perspective that parents aren't even meant to have, you know, they don't have, and it's, it, they're not even meant to have. But I think of grandparenting in a way as um, a kind of, it, some of the qualities that grandparents have, which is a trust in the healthy force, force of development, the lack of everyday anxiety about what they're, you know, the kids are doing and how it reflects on them, which is something parents have to deal with every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, so many other things, a kind of um, spaciousness or equanimity right. or a generosity of view, you know, all these things that come with um, age and experience. You can have them. You can have some of these qualities. You can strengthen some of these qualities uh, through the practice of mindfulness. And one of my early teachers was a Japanese Zen monk. And I was probably, and it was probably around 30 or 31 when, at this time when he said this, but it struck me so deeply. He said, um, meditation, Zazen, meditation gives you premature wisdom. Oh, and I yeah. loved that because I thought, Everyone's going to get wise when they're old, but it's sort of sad to only have wisdom when, you know, you wish you could have had it, the benefit of that during your younger years too. And so I do encourage parents um, as much as possible to dip your toes in. Many of you certainly already have, many of your listeners I'm sure have, Susan, but um, but yeah, it's, it gives, it's, it's a support, it's a kind of ballast, um, a grounding for this intensely important and compelling and challenging work oh. of being a parent. I was thinking, I, it was either John Kabat-Zinn in a conversation I had with him or your husband, Jack Cornfield, in some interview referred to children living with children as living with little zen masters or you know this idea that in the like you said the challenges yes there's the beauty the love the awe inspiring miracle of oh my gosh is that that's just yeah i have no I, words but there's also the day to day whew, and i have had so many parents in my community who are meditators who are mindfulness practitioners or yoga practitioners. And they had this idea before the child came of, oh, you know, we're gonna have, you know, my little girl will be named Harmony and, you know, we'll just, and, you know, sometimes it works out the way we imagine, but more often than not, we are confronted by our temper, our impatience, our resentment, our hurt feelings, our anxiety. Let's talk a little bit about some of the realities that maybe people are a little reluctant to admit to having, but I'd like to get it out in the open because then it can be looked at and worked with and healed. So I'm sure, I mean, you run a, an incredible community inside LA where I've been so fortunate to visit from time to time and always feel soothed and comforted when I leave. And I love at the end where you invite people to speak honestly about a challenge that they're facing. Can you kind of play with that idea, like some of the truth yeah. of, of this? Yeah, for sure. First of all, that remark about the children being Zen masters, I want to, I want to unpack that a little bit because- Yeah, 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 thank you. It's, it's, it's misleading, you know, the children, what, that, what they were saying, what um, John was saying or Jack when they said that, you have to understand Zen practice is designed to make you uncomfortable. 
Zen practice is designed to make you suffer. You have to sit for long periods of time without moving, your legs hurt. You have to follow a schedule that isn't your own. You have to, I mean, there's just lots of things involved that create um, discomfort. Uh, some, sometimes in retreat, there's not enough sleep. And so you have to deal with your own, and it's all designed to bring your own irritability and your own um, impatience and your own uh, self-loathing and your own you know, despair and all these things that everybody doesn't want to admit or see get highlighted. And you think, oh my God, it's making me worse. There's some mistake. No, there's no mistake. It's really because when we can see these things about ourselves in an environment that actually provides a lot of structure and care, they can be worked with and understood compassionately and maybe not healed completely. We're all human anyway, but helped a lot. The thing is the children are not wise teachers consciously poking us and pushing our buttons. They're just reality in the form of a child being that child. And, and yet there's no way that a toddler can be who they are, authentically who they are, and not push your buttons <laughs> because they're going to have meltdowns right at the very moment when you're in a hurry to get to work and you've got to get someplace. They're going to have um, one, you know, the, the meal they loved the night before and you made it again a couple nights later, they suddenly treat it as though it's like poo-poo on their plate. I mean, it goes on and on, you know, it's really hard. And I'll tell you, I remember, I don't think I've ever told this story out loud, but when my daughter was four years old um, and I was a single mom at that time, I remember just feeling despair. I mean, even her little voice was so grating by the end of the day. This is my beloved daughter, right? And I felt guilty and ashamed for my feelings. And nobody was ever talking about anything except the glory of motherhood and the beauty of children. And I'm suffering and feeling not only like a failure, I just, I felt like um, a very abnormal, actually. And I remember talking to a friend and, and confiding in her and saying, I don't know what to do. I'm really struggling with myself. And this was before I had learned to meditate, which happened when she was five. Um, but, and my friend said to me, oh, just love her. It was so unhelpful. I was thinking, I yeah, felt more ashamed. I, was yeah. I felt, and you know who helped me the most in those days who was telling the truth was a poet named Alta, A-L-T-A, a feminist poet. I don't even know if she's still alive or anything. She was telling the truth about the hard stuff about being a mom. And I was just eating it up because people weren't talking about this. And maybe they still don't so much. Maybe there's pressure. Maybe, you know, we didn't have social media. Maybe now with social media, there's pressure to look perfect or seem like your family's always having fun. Do you remember a video that circulated at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I, this was another thing. I loved it because it just cut right through all of that pretense, um, even unconscious pretense. You know, we don't even know we're pretending. We're just trying to do the right thing. Um, and it showed a woman, uh, you know, obviously home in lockdown. And she was speaking, you know, there was, you could tell she, she was speaking to the camera and she was saying things like, oh, this enforced time alone is so wonderful for our family. And then she would hold up a note card so that whoever was there couldn't hear her and said, I'm going crazy. <laughs> and then she would say, we're doing all kinds of activities that we would never have done before when we were all busy and going our separate ways. And then she would hold up the sign that said, let me out of here now. And then, you know, it, it just went on and on where she was saying all these things you were reading that people were saying about lockdown and their families and so sweet and time together. And, and she was talking about, you know, if I have to 
pick up another spill, I'm going to kill myself. Or, you know, it just, yeah. So I think there's always that the both sides of the situation. Yes, yeah. we love our families. We love, I loved my four-year-old, but I didn't know how when, when I felt depleted and yeah. unskillful and bewildered. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. Um, and oddly enough, just being able to sit with myself the way that I learned to do when I met my first meditation teacher, who was actually John's first uh, Buddhist teacher as well. It was through John Kabat-Zinn and Larry Rosenberg that I met him. And we started all uh, meditating with this teacher from Korea. And there was something about being given permission to just sit there and be who I was. And just, I, I remember feeling like, oh, I get to express myself. Myself was expressing to itself, you know, and there was no pressure to be a certain way, to have anything happen. Uh, well, sure, we were supposed to get enlightened, but that was that Over was there. on the road, right? I, I, I came to understand uh, after a few years more what that was about, but just at the beginning, it was for survival, really. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, it just soothes me, and that's my goal. Like I was saying to you before we started to record that part of my work, even though I try and bring in just the best possible people to work with, associate with, you know, teach with. I want to provide practical, really tested guidance and strategies for parents. But I also, especially in my membership, I, I want to be holding a place for parents of comfort and solace because we are so hard on ourselves. And if you imagine, you know, the average parent does get upset and annoyed and frustrated. I mean, we're just human. We don't change species just because we've become parents. And the image of the parent falling into bed at night, maybe there's been a 45 minute argument over getting in bed and staying in bed and no more water, or maybe you know the whole evening was an argument about screen time. And, and so, so many of us fall into bed just tense and stressed and regretful, remorseful, feeling like this is not what I pictured, you know, and I, I just love that we can hold a place that you and I can have this conversation, even ho however brief, to, to just normalize that and then to invite parents to be okay with that coexisting with all the other good stuff that goes on inside. I like the idea of you sitting and just being with that. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even know the mechanism by which this happens. You know, I think many of your um, learned expert guests <laughs> maybe could speak more to that. I don't know the mechanism of how this happens. I just know that the willingness to sit there and to be who we are in a supportive context, this is not done all alone. And that's important because if I had been told to just sit by myself, Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, when I was feeling rotten and just be with myself, that would not probably have been quite so helpful. Mm -hmm. I was sitting um, in a context where it was understood that we were in a crucible where everybody was sweating bullets of one kind or another, whether they had kids or not, everybody had their life uh, challenges. And that's why we were there. Everybody was drawn there because of some kind of personal um, search for understanding and, and soothing and relief from their own suffering. And I think for parents, you know, obviously you're not going to run to a meditation center at night when your child is asleep. But now that this is one of the blessings among many of the um, pitfalls and curses of technology, making it hard to govern our world and everything else we know about it, there is this blessing of being able to connect and be part of a community without leaving your home. Yeah, yeah. And to, to find a place to take a class, to sit with people, 
to, I mean, I know people recommend apps, but apps are okay, but it's a little less personal than being part of a community. Yeah. Um, and, but anything, anything that keeps you company and allows you to be present with your misery long enough to see that it will change. This is one of the fundamental truths of life and, you know, uh, and Buddhist psychology too, that everything is changing all the time. You know, we get fixed in our view and we don't see it. Although if you're a parent of a young children, of young child, you can see it because they're changing so fast. Mm. Um, and I am so grateful to you for recommending that Apple TV series, Becoming oh. You. I've recommended it to so many oh, people. Okay. And if your listeners haven't watched it, it's very, very beautiful understanding of how impermanence works in child development. Um, but for us as parents, um, and of course I'm a grandparent now, but for us as parents to be able to understand that whatever state of mind and heart we happen to be in, it's not personal. It's just a result of some causes and conditions that have happened. Mm -hmm. An upset child, a reactive parent, what could be more, you know, um, ordinary? This is, this is how our life is. And it's a combination of these impersonal uh, circumstances and or universal might even be better they're just universal situations and when we sit down like that to be present with something and we're agitated or in a state of remorse like you were saying Susan um, understanding that at whatever state or mind of mind or heart that we are in it will change and one of the things about sitting still and being quiet for a while is that you start to see the changing. When we're busy doing activities, the dishes, the wiping the counters, the putting away the toys, the cleaning up of the folding the laundry, all the things that we do and need to do, and we can do them very mindfully and it's really important. But just sitting still for five or 10 or 15 minutes, you start to see that movement of change in a way that it's harder to do when you're moving around. So I do wanna make a pitch for doing That's that good. yeah I, i'm glad you did that and i'm glad you talked about community because um also i've i've practiced meditation in one form or another since the early 70s and again it was sort of like a hidden part of who i was and now it's something like oh well, you know you go to the grocery store what kind of my meditation do you do you know it's just so universally present at least in this country um but I like the idea of community. I'm a huge, huge fan of us holding hands as we do this thing. It's why I have a community. I have a parenting membership. And I know you have Insight LA, which I believe you do some of your classes online, don't you? We do. All our classes are online right now. Oh, wow. Okay. It's online. Amazing. Um, and there's all different kinds of classes. They're all online. Um, and there's also... Um, a people of color, a BIPOC group. And I mentioned this because the challenges for black and brown parents are yeah. uh, different from the challenges. I mean, they have all the same challenges and then more mm -hmm. having to do with different conversations that black and brown parents have to have with their children about what it is like to grow up in a society where there's just racism pervading much of life. Um, so, there's all kinds of uh, classes on awareness of this and other things. And, you know, we used to have more things specifically for parents and kids when I was, um, when I was sort of in charge of that part. I don't know really what there is right now. There's usually something and what it has, we just need to have teachers who are parents and who are really, yeah. you know, immersed and caring yeah. about that. Um, for me, it was, I've worked with children so much of my life. I didn't have to be a parent to care about that. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the community, the comp having company, yeah. having somebody in your life that you can tell the truth to. Exactly. You know, it's really vital. And they're not going to judge you. They're going to love you anyway. And they're going to love you through it. I did a um, 
podcast recently with Kristen Neff. And I oh, know yeah. you know Kristen. Yeah. And I have her book next to my bed, Fierce Self-Compassion. And I read it almost every day. I read a little bit more. So all of this, I know we have to go, but all of this is to say to parents, all of you listening, look for support. Tell your truth in safe environments. With, find a safe community. Um, I mean, I, we just had a member call today and it's so touching to me when parents speak their truth, at, you know, the sort of expose the dark underbelly. And then you see, as you say, you stay with it and you see it morphing and transforming into something benign and gentle. And, and all this feeling of even self-compassion arises when we step away from the yeah, 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 in our head that sort of, how'd you do that? Why couldn't you have stayed cool? What's the matter with you? Why, your neighbor never does that. So all of you listening, that's kind of a, an invitation to start looking at the narrative and consider aligning yourself with some resource, even if it's just a close neighbor friend who will listen with kindness and be, become someone safe to offload some of the ongoing challenges of living with our beautiful and challenging sometimes little ones. Anything you want to say by way of wrapping up? Too. Yeah, I want to thank you for naming self-compassion. That's really important. And I think that's what I was talking about without naming it. So thank you for naming that. Um, and for mentioning a kind neighbor. Um, and I want to say too, there are um, older people like me who are either grandparents away from their grandchildren or um, they aren't grandparents yet or maybe never will be, but who would take an interest in you and be happy to be part of your life and support Absolutely. you. So yeah. don't forget, there is another you know, <laughs> resource. That yeah. In fact, the last two weekends, my husband and I have watched our friends, little girls. They have a six-year-old and a not quite three-month-old. And we are, <laughs> we've announced ourselves as surrogate grandparents and it's just pure joy. So, it's joy for you and what a blessing for the parents. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. All Thank right. You. Will you share your websites one more time, Trudy? Uh, TrudyGoodman.com. Uh, and you can find my my blogs on that one. It's, it's an old website, but it still works. And InsightLA.org, where you will find all the classes and under under resources in the menu, the navigation bar on top, you'll find lots of guided meditations, short Ooh. ones, five minutes, 10 minutes. And um, just even to do five minutes of loving kindness for yourself as you fall asleep, you Ooh. know, this is a great resource for you. So Beautiful. thank you, Susan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so and much. I'll see you again. Bye. Thank you.